Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the last day of the uh, Soro African Interferometry uh, Workshop. And this morning, we will kick off our cosmology section. And the first presentation this uh, morning will be on the cosmic dawn and the epoch of reionization um, presented by Anastasia. Now, Anastasia um, grew up in Kazakhstan. Uh, she completed her undergrad and a PhD in Tel Aviv University in, in Israel. And after completing her study, she took up postdoc fellowships at various institutes across Europe and the UK. Currently, she is pursuing her research at the University Royal, as a University um, Royal Society Fellow and lecturer at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. Anastasia, we're looking forward to your talk. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for this invitation. I will be talking about um, hydrogen 21 centimeter line and uh, what can we do with it. So it's a very, let's say, high level talk. I don't go much into the details. And uh, please feel free to ask me after this uh, lecture if you have any questions. So the talk is about uh, hydrogen atoms in the universe. And uh, they are, in a sense, the simplest structure that we have. It's just a proton and an electron around it. Uh, and it's, uh, I find it amazing after a decade of research in this field that uh, the simple building block can tell us a lot about the evolution of the universe, formation of the very first stars, black holes, uh, and maybe even tell us uh, what dark matter is. So it's uh, very interesting to see how and understand how this hydrogen atoms carry the inf information and uh, how can we measure it. There are some interesting facts. For example, 21 centimeter line is a forbidden transition of hydrogen atoms. It means that it's very rare uh, and it cannot be observed in the lab because of that. It happens uh, at the rate of 2.9 times 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So once per 10 million years, a hydrogen atom has a chance to emit a photon that is uh, that has 21 centimeter wavelength, 21 centimeter long wavelength. So it's very rare, but uh, the universe is so vast, huge, uh, and most of the matter, especially at early times, is in the form of hydrogen atoms. 74% by masses in hydrogen. And so this collectively gives us observable signals that uh, people like uh, us are trying to measure and uh, decipher the universe. This is a very promising probe, as I will show you in this talk, of the formation mechanisms of first stars and black holes, nature of dark matter, and uh, it can help us to test cosmology in the new unexplored regime. Uh, first detection uh, we only recently had, it's a very young field, uh, and the first detection is still unconfirmed, so we don't know if it's a real signal or spurious, if it's created by the instrument or, or the real cosmological events. So it dates uh, back to when the universe was roughly 75, um, a few hundred million years old. Uh, and in terms of cosmological redshifts, uh, it would mean that first stars were forming around redshift of 17, uh, which is very early in terms of uh, the history of the universe. So this signal is uh, very strange, uh, and it's unlike what uh, I will be telling you today, uh, unlike our conventional thinking about what 21 centimeter signals can uh, can be uh, if we take into account normal star formation mechanisms and evolution of galaxy structures. Uh, and on this bottom panel here, you see in blue this edges detection, uh, and in red, green, gray, and black, uh, some examples of conventional 21 centimeter signals that we expect to measure. And we see that the edges signal is uh, way deeper and more intense than normal. Uh, scenarios. So we still don't know what is what it is, but that's an observational status of the field. And they will be talking a little bit more about that at the end of my talk. So I realize I don't have time, uh, don't, don't have a watch, so please tell me if I'm uh, running over my time slot. Okay. 
Okay, and the outline of this talk is that first I will introduce the 21 centimeter line, how it is produced and how it is actually related to cosmic events in the history of the universe, such as the formation of first stars and the radiation that they emitted. Uh, and then I will tell you about how we model it, what goes into modeling and uh, a bit on observational challenges. So 21 centimeter line, um, is produced by hydrogen atoms, as I mentioned, and it's uh, emitted when a hydrogen atom undergoes a spin flip transition. We know that the spins of proton and electron can be either aligned or anti aligned, so being parallel or anti parallel. And the energy of the state where they are anti parallel is a bit lower than the energy of the state when they are parallel. Uh, the, this difference is tiny. Uh, but when an atom undergoes this transition, for some reason, a photon with a wavelength of 21 centimeters produced. This is this forbidden transition. So it's due to the angular uh, interaction of uh, spins that we can actually probe the first star formation. So we will start with a broader description of how the universe evolved. Uh, and here we see a cartoonish representation of that, starting from the emission of cosmic microwave background on the left to the present on the right. And um, on this picture, the x-axis uh, is time or redshift, and y-axis is a slice through, uh, through cosmos at that specific time. So we see on this picture how structure evolved uh, and galaxies formed in a very simple way. So the furthest we can observe with telescopes is uh, back to cosmic microwave background radiation today. And it probes the universe when it was uh, 400,000 years old. So it, uh, it's uh, a cosmological redshift of, of about a thousand. And at that time, the universe was tiny, hot, uh, and uh, before production of this cosmic microwave background radiation, it was in a state of plasma. So there were no atoms, there were just uh, a soup of protons, electrons, uh, and other elementary particles, uh, coupled to radiation, photons. And at some point, and the universe was, of course, expanding and cooling down, therefore. If you take a gas balloon and expand it, the gas temperature will drop uh, because of thermodynamics. And so when the universe was expanding, co cooling down, this plasma underwent a phase transition, forming first neutral atoms in the history of the universe. Uh, and with that, radiation stopped interacting with this plasma. And uh, since then, it was freely moving through space and can be observed today in the form of cosmic microwave background. And we know that if you measure the spectrum of cosmic microwave background, it's the most uh, ideal uh, black body that we can find in nature. So the spectrum measured by COBE satellite uh, around already 30 something years ago shows a perfect black body line. Uh, this is important for 21 centimeter cosmology because the CMB spectrum provides a background light uh, against which we can see the 21 centimeter production. So just from measuring this uh, CMB, which uh, probes actually uh, a very thin slice in terms of time in the history of the universe, we already learned that the universe is uh, very well described by a rather simple cosmological model containing cosmological constant called dark matter and a small portion of variance, only about 5%. Uh, and we can also study the spectrum of the fluctuations, as you can see in this middle panel of uh, the CMB. We can do power spectrum of that and explore how uh, isotropic this radiation was. We see the same radiation coming from all directions in space. Uh, and there is a lot of um, knowledge about the universe that we learned just from that uh, one slice in time probe by the CMB. 
So going further, uh, after the CMB decoupling, we see that this initial fluctuations that we saw on the CMB map, so here, uh, bright spots, uh, yellow and red spots are places where there were a bit uh, more matter that are called over dense regions. Uh, and the blue spots are places where there was a bit less matter under dense regions. So at the time of the CMB, this uh, nonlinearity over densities, they were um, very small, just about 10 to the minus five of the mean density in the universe. So the universe was largely smooth and matter was distributed homogeneously on everywhere. But uh, with the evolution of the universe, uh, these non-homogeneities grow because of gravity. We know that gravity attracts everything. So over dense regions were becoming more and more massive and under dense regions less and less massive. Uh, and the uh, slowly non-linear structures uh, formed uh, such as uh, dark matter halos, clusters, filaments and walls. Uh, baryons were lagging behind dark matter be because uh, at the time of cosmic micro background, they were coupled to radiation, so they were dragged around while dark matter had this power to collapse. Uh, but after the CMB decoupling, uh, baryons were free to follow dark matter, and they started to gather together in, inside dark matter halos. And when gas reaches a certain density and temperature, it can start condensing into stars uh, and nuclear fusion starts and uh, the formation of stars uh, begins. So this uh, period is usually referred to as cosmic dawn when the first stars and galaxies uh, started to form. Uh, and uh, our current understanding tells us that uh, the smallest dark matter halo which forms galaxies is about 10 to the five solar masses. You do need a big dark matter halo, at least of 10 to the 5 solar masses in order to accelerate gas when it falls inside dark matter. It starts emitting radiation and thus it cools because radiation carries some energy away. It's called radiative cooling process. And then this cold gas can actually condense into the stars. So formation of the very first stars is still a, a, an uncertain process. We have never seen that. Uh, and it's very hard to simulate that in numerical simulations because very high resolutions need to be reached. Uh, and um, this needs to happen in the cosmological setting. So we still don't know very well how uh, first stars formed and what were the characteristics. For example, if you have a gas cloud put in, into a halo, we would create one big star or many small stars. We don't know that yet. It depends on a lot of uh, uh, what is called feedback mechanisms, such as uh, if the gas is rotating, uh, there is turbulence and it breaks up into smaller clumps. So this is first stars, uh, and we think that they started forming already about stretch of 60, but the ma a majority of the population arose at around stretch of 30 or 25. So when the stars form, they start affecting the universe uh, because they produce radiation, and these photons can do a lot of uh, uh, damage or feedback back into the uh, what is called intergalactic medium, the gas in the surrounding areas, uh, in the area surrounding the star forming region. So in, uh, if you, in the absence of stars, the gas here was just cooling down with cosmic expansion adiabatically and was uh, cold and neutral. Then when stars form, the radiation will have several effects. In particular, they will ionize gas, right? The uh, stars produce a lot of UV photons, which can just break this uh, hydrogen atoms and, and helium atoms in the intergalactic medium, creating an ionized region around the star or the first galaxy. Uh, first stars will explode creating x-rays, x-ray binaries or black holes that emit x-rays and x-rays will hit the gas 
So around each star forming region, there will be a bubble of hot gas, and it uh, generally will be much bigger than the bubble of ionized gas because extra photons can travel to larger distances. Uh, stars and uh, stellar products uh, also produce different types, other different types of radiation. For example, they can emit radio, adding to the cosmic microwave background, uh, the CMB, uh, and they produce the whole spectrum of photons that will affect the intergalactic medium, and in particular, the efficiency with which 21 centimeter photons are produced. So that's just a side note to show you how uh, with how gas temperatures evolves compared to the CMB. And, and it is shown thinking that uh, x-axis here is in log of one plus redshift, so log uh, logarithm base 10. Uh, and the y-axis is logarithm of temperatures. So in, on this log-log scale, CMB temperature will just drop as one plus Z because ga uh, temperature is cooling down of the radiation at that rate. So we see just a linear drop in, in the CMP temperature, this white line. And the gas temperature will be more complicated. At very high redshifts, uh, gas is still coupled to the CMB through collisions between photons and the residual tiny uh, amount of ionized gas. I told you that gas was fully neutral here, but that's a bit incorrect. It's ionized to the 10 to the minus 4. So a 10 to the minus 4 fraction of uh, atoms in the universe will be in ionized state at that time. But when the universe expands further, these collisions become inefficient, and so gas decouples thermally from the CMP and starts cooling down much faster because, uh, again, of thermodynamical laws, uh, gas atoms uh, will cool faster than radiation. And so it cools down faster than the CMP until the moment when uh, X-ray binaries or other X-ray sources form in large quantities and start emitting X-ray radiation. And the sex rays will heat up the gas and the gas temperature will rise uh, to somewhere above the CMB. So there is uh, this interesting succession of uh, thermal history here. And we will see that uh, the thermal history actually is uh, fundamental for the shape of the 21 centimeter radiation produced. So we discussed dark ages when there were no stars, cosmic dawn when the first stars were produced, and then uh, we arrived to the epoch of ionization. And it's just uh, when these first ionized bubbles that were tiny at the beginning during cosmic dawn, they grow to large uh, sizes and eventually they all overlap uh, so that the, the whole of the universe is ionized. So all the spaces between star forming regions become ionized. Uh, and that's called the uh, epoch of ionization. And that's is the last uh, phase transition that the uh, gas underwent in our universe. So today, the intergalactic medium is hot and ionized. Uh, and the simplest. Uh, Equivalent to the epoch of ionization is a Swiss cheese with uh, bubbles of uh, ionized gas in, uh, in white here, show embedded in the steel neutral gas at the early stages. Uh, and then if you picture these bubbles grow in time, that's how ionization works. Uh, and this process can be probed with a 21 centimeter signal. So naturally, 21 centimeter wavelength is produced by atomic hydrogen, so neutral hydrogen. So it, it will be only produced from all this uh, yellow cheese regions, which were not inside ionized bubbles. Because inside ionized bubbles, there is no neutral gas to the first the leading order. So we will only be looking at neutral gas with the 21 centimeter line. Uh, nowadays, there are very sophisticated simulations. So the Swiss cheese model is very, uh, it's like a toy model to help intuition. But uh, there are very uh, advanced techniques to simulate realization, putting in 
all the relevant radiative processes and tracking the growth of structure, production of uh, UV photons and so on. So here on the here I show you a slice of the of the one of the latest simulations in the sub in the area uh, by Piero Svirk and collaborators called CODA Cosmic Dawn Simulation. Uh, and I really put in all possible physics. The simulation ran for a month on the one of the world's biggest supercomputers, taking up the whole supercomputer. Uh, and I think it's just a great achievement. So they uh, simulate this process of realization in great detail. And realization today is one of the best probes epochs out of what I described, except for the CMB, because uh, it's closest to us. And, and uh, there are already observations in the epoch of realization of uh, some galaxies and quasars that can tell us about the evolution of neutral fraction at this stage when uh, uh, INS bubbles were emerging. Uh, by observing the quasar absorption profiles, we can uh, measure this neutral fraction. And we roughly know that transition ended at redshift 6. Uh, and it was on the way at redshift 8. But that's roughly it, what we, uh, what we know. Other than that, uh, our cosmological surveys mostly probe lower redshifts. So, for example, SDSS, CHIME, uh, DAISY, BOSS, and so and others, they probe uh, lower redshift universe out to redshift 3. So they probe cosmic volume, large cosmic volumes, but not to very high redshifts that I'm interested in. Uh, while during realization and the high redshifts uh, that span cosmic dawn and uh, dark ages, there are literally no observations yet. So we don't have any information that we can test our theories with. And that's uh, um, some uh, pictures of the one, uh, some of the most distant quasars. Here is a quasar at redshift 7.5, and uh, the distant to date galaxy at redshift 11. So these are very bright sources, but we only have a few of them to test our theories at that time. And the 21 centimeter line offers a, us a way to probe all this missing volume from between the decoupling from the cosmic micro background to the end of realization by probing uh, thermal and ionized state of the neutral gas throughout the evolution of the universe. So I already mentioned that uh, this line is produced by hydrogen atoms when they undergo spin flip transition. Uh, and uh, um, this signal probes the neutral regions between INS bubbles here. Uh, and its intensity will depend on the rate with which atoms can undergo the spin flip transition. And this rate, in turn, depends on the properties of the first stars, for example, how luminous they were, and also on the temperature of the gas and the density of the gas, cosmological parameters, and so on. So it's a very rich uh, signal in terms of cosmological and astrophysical information. I will be talking about this quantity called spin temperature, Ts. Uh, and in a sense, it's just proportional to the ratio of the num of the atoms in this excited state to the atoms in the lower state. So it measures the rate of the transition. Uh, in a sense, uh, 21 centimeter will be compatible to having a CMB, inf CMB quality information from every separate redshift because uh, it's a very thin, narrow line. Uh, and then we know that all scales in the universe expand with the expansion of the universe. So the wavelength, uh, 21 centimeter, is actually the intrinsic wavelength at which signal is produced. But because of the expansion of the universe, it will be moved to longer wavelengths, uh, depending on at which redshift it was produced at. So therefore, by observing different wavelengths, we can uh, trace back in time, 
the evolution of the universe and uh, create a topological map. So we will have special information and also redshift information from every separate redshift. Uh, and this uh, signal will tell us the matter distribution, thermal ionization histories, astrophysical properties of first sources, cosmology in these new regimes, uh, and it will give us access to very large scales, uh, different from between the size of the galaxy and the size of the universe, basically. So I'm not talking about observational effort here. You'll hear more today later on that. But there, are, there is a significant effort, uh, in particular in South Africa with uh, HERA and the uh, SKA. Uh, but that's not the only efforts in the field. There are many other experiments, uh, including space missions that are already planned uh, and in development, such as DEPR. So it's a very exciting and rapidly evolving field. So now I'm going a bit more into details of how we model the signal. And uh, we uh, observe it with the CMB as a background radiation. And basically, when the CMB goes through hydrogen gas, it can be either absorbed at the intrinsic local 21 centimeter wavelength, if the gas is much colder than the CMB, uh, or it can be uh, incremented, so more photons can be emitted into the CMB if the gas is hotter. So what actually is ob we observe is a distorted CMB spectrum. And when, when we subtract this uh, expected CMB profile out, we get this 21 centimeter signal that we expect to see. So the signal depends on several processes, as I mentioned, and uh, we can write is its intensity uh, in terms of brightness temperature. So we can take intensity of this line, convert it into temperature because we are talking about very long wavelengths in the Rayleigh genes regime. So there is a linear relation between temperature and intensity. Uh, and in this field, it's conventional to talk about brightness temperatures. So we take this brightness temperature, subtract the CMP out, and this is what we get, this expression. So it's not complete. You can go to some of the uh, literature, such as a nice review by Furlanetto, Bragg, and Och, uh, to, for the full expression. But the most interesting terms is, is that um, this brightness temperature is proportional to the uh, fraction of the ionized volume or neutral volume because we said already that uh, 21 centimeters produced by neutral hydrogen. Then there is this term of uh, related to the gas temperature and sp spin temperature, temperature of the background radiation of the CMB. And this, is, uh, this comes as a result of the radiative transfer uh, solution. So in uh, lead at leading order, it equals to min one minus this ratio of the background temperature or spin temperature. Uh, and then there is a, a bunch of terms that uh, encode cosmology, such as uh, linear density field, but there are also this dot, dot, dot uh, has a lot of cosmological information that at the moment they ignore in this talk. So it is expected to have much smaller effect than the ionized neutral fraction and temperatures. So I will focus on those in the stock. So uh, we said that uh, brightness temperature is roughly proportion is proportional to the uh, amount of neutral gas. And then we need to understand how uh, the CMB tem the radiation temperature and spin temperature evolved. So spin temperature is a has a complicated dependence on gas temperature ionization uh, and the uh, amount of uh, UV photons produced by stars. Uh, so that when there are no stars and there is only CMB, the spin temperature just by thermal equilibrium goes to the temperature of the CMB. It takes some time because this uh, interaction is very low rate but eventually it goes, so it goes to the radiation temperature. But as soon as stars form and start producing lime-alpha radiation, 
this actually drives spin temperature to the temperature of the gas. And uh, also if atoms collide efficiently, spin temperature will be driven to the temperature of the gas. So because of these processes, we can actually observe the 21 centimeter against the CMB because uh, otherwise, if the gas was at the temperature of the CMB, we would not see anything, right? In this equation, we would just get zero. But as soon as spin temperature starts deviating from the temperature of the background radiation, either because of the lamina alpha coupling from stars or because of the collisions, we will see this, uh, this radiation. So that's a very important effect that enables us to measure the 21 centimeter. And then we have, uh, again, dependence on cosmology. So uh, we saw that uh, background distribution of matter is not uniform. So we actually will see that in 21 centimeters as well. Uh, and it also uh, depends on how structure forms, how halos grow, how cosmic web evolves. So a lot of information here. If you, when you put everything together and track the evolution of cosmic events uh, in a simulation, this is an example of simulation that I made. Uh, so again, on y-axis, uh, on y-axis is a slice through a cosmological box and x-axis is cosmic time. Uh, and uh, what we see is called a light cone, 21 centimeter signal. So we will see that it actually evolves uh, yellow uh, here corresponds to zero signal, uh, and this blue is absorption, so gas is much colder than the CMB, so we will see it, this delta TB uh, will be negative, we will see gas in absorption against the CMB. So we see that it's non-homogeneous, there are structures imprinted by the underlying distribution of matter, uh, star formation that produced radiation is also non-uniform. Uh, first star forming regions are rare and they produce radiation that is centered around them. So these profiles will be imprinted in the 21 centimeter maps. Uh, and it's important to realize also that measuring 21 centimeter from different epochs will tell us about different uh, populations. For example, uh, reionization, epoch of reionization will inform us about more massive galaxies and quasars that formed at later times and were efficient at producing UV photons that the time as the gas. While cosmic dawn, observing 21 centimeter from cosmic dawn, will tell us about the formation of very first stars and small halos and very first black holes. So these are uh, a bit two different epochs and uh, different populations that drive the 21 centimeter signal. Oh, somehow things didn't go through, but that's fine. So <clears throat> when we studied 21 centimeter signal, uh, we talk about several statistical representations. For example, we can average a 21 centimeter emission over simulation cubes at every separate redshift. And so it's like averaging along y-axis in this uh, light cone picture that I show you. Uh, and the averaging and tracing how the average evolves with redshift will give us what is called global signal. So this global signal looks like uh, this black line on the slide. Uh, and it has wiggles and uh, absorption peak and emission trough. And this all inform us, informs us about uh, the mean evolution of the universe throughout the history, how, what is the big picture when the first population of stars formed and when the first X-ray binaries formed and when the first massive galaxies formed and then as the gas. So this first absorption trough here, it is created when first stars started producing lime alpha radiation in large quantity in some quantities coupling the spin temperature to the temperature of the gas which was colder than the cmb and so we see it in absorption and then when x-ray binaries form we start seeing it in emission uh, eventually because gas heats up to the temperature above the, uh, the cmb 
Uh, and then when massive galaxies form, the neutral fraction drops because they ionize more and more of the gas and the signal drops to zero. So that's how we uh, expect, that's the global signal that we expect to see. However, uh, there are other statistical metrics that one can extract from such a rich map. And uh, another example is uh, power spectrum fluctuations. So like um, from CMB, you can measure power spectrum, right? Just doing a Fourier transform of that. We can do it for 21 centimeter at every redshift separately. And sometimes people like to show how a fixed co-moving angular scale, so fixed angular scale on the sky evolves uh, with redshift. So how the power at this angular scale evolves with redshift. Uh, and this again will have uh, features like peaks and troughs. Uh, and this time, uh, these troughs and peaks tell us about uh, fluctuations. So about what drove these fluctuations, which sources were dominant, how they were distributed around the sky, uh, and what was their um, kind of uh, area of uh, how, how much area each source affected. So what were their spectra and characteristic lengths in the problem? So of course, the, because we don't know much about the universe at that time, there is not just one line. I cannot tell you that the universe looked like that and that's it. And that's what we expect to see. And that's what the experiments will measure. But rather there is a large range of uh, expectations both for global signal on the right here and for power spectra on the left, uh, because by varying mechanisms in, uh, through which stars formed and uh, varying formation efficiencies, varying ma masses of star forming halos and uh, for uh, efficiency in ionizing and heating the gas, we can get the full zoo of models that span large space uh, in the, in the brightness, temperature, frequency uh, picture. So there is not one possibility, there are infinite possibilities that we need to, we, we can expect and uh, we only need to observations to probe the signals and tell us what the true universe looked like. So a bit more on how we model actually the signal in real work. So we need to put in all this information that I just uh, uh, told you about how first us formed, what were the smallest star forming hills, how the star formation mechanisms and distribution of stars evolved, uh, how halos grew with time, uh, what were the uh, radiative efficiencies of the sources what was the nature of dark matter and so on. So we need the mathematical or we need cosmological simulations that have all this physics inside. We also need to simulate very large cosmological scales because experiments such as SKA uh, will probe large volumes of the sky. Uh, and we need to trace this uh, through the whole cosmic evolution from roughly a decoupling of the CMB to the end of reionization. So these are challenges simulations to make that need to have cosmic volumes resolved of gigaparsec scales, but also need to take into account star and galaxy formation on, on tiny scales of uh, basically astronomical units. Right, and uh, we also know that the universe is not uniform, so it, uh, things happen at different times in different uh, locations. Uh, and the simulations need to take this also into account. And on top of that, we know that uh, there is some scatter. So depending on how galaxies merged in this local region, uh, how structures evolved, star formation and the uh, photon production might be slightly different in different places around the sky. So it would contribute to the richness of the 21 centimeter signal but that also needs to be modeled somehow. So what we do, what I do is a, a hybrid approach. So we have large scale simulations 
but they don't resolve tiny details because uh, very small scales will not be resolved by telescopes such as SK or HERA. Uh, and so we use uh, what is called subgrid physics, subgrid models to input star formation. So we don't resolve every individual star, which would be impossible, uh, but we put in this basically uh, using semi-numerical prescriptions. Uh, and this results in a relatively fast simulation run in just a few hours uh, that allows us to vary properties of stars, uh, star formation mechanisms, and study how this changes the uh, result in 21 centimeter signals. So by changing different uh, prescriptions for star formation, star feedback, heating, ionization, we get to all these different lines. Uh, that I already showed you. And just to go uh, a bit more into detail, so the signal at very high redshifts uh, before star formation will be driven by uh, distribution of uh, matter and uh, relative velocities between dark matter and gas. Uh, and it also depends on the nature of dark matter. So this is dark ages before stars form, uh, and they can be very useful to probe in the dark matter properties. Uh, in this stretch of range between roughly 20 and 30, we are mostly affected by the first stars. So what do we assume about the first stars? Uh, what were the smallest halos in which stars could form? Were they 10 to the 5 solar masses and gas and stars forming through uh, by cooling of molecular hydrogen or were they more massive uh, and cooling of different uh, elements such as atomic hydrogen was more efficient. So this process affects the signal in this uh, area and uh, the drop uh, that we see, the onset of this absorption feature in the global signal and the first uh, peak in the fluctuations of the 21 centimeter signal. Then going further, X-rays become more important because line of uh, photons are abundant and they actually saturate, they don't affect the signal anymore. So the peak drops and uh, then when X-ray binaries form in large quantities, they start heating up the gas, this emission profile arises uh, and they uh, usually imprint another peak in the spectrum uh, of fluctuations. Uh, but uh, as uh, we find uh, specific properties of extra sources such as the spectrum and uh, efficiency, they will affect the power spectrum. For example, the presence of this uh, peak in the spectrum will depend on the hardness of X-ray photons. For example, the dominant energy of X-rays is at around 0.2 kV or 1 kV. These differences matter for how the spectrum would look like. And so by observing the spectrum uh, using inverse logic, we can uh, actually understand what was the uh, spe spectrum of X-ray sources, what was the typical energy that they produced. So here are the examples of uh, gas temperature here on the left in case uh, of gas heated by soft sources or hard sources. So here on the top are uh, hard sources. Uh, ignore this uh, title, it's wrong. So if sources are very hard uh, with typical energy of around 1 kV or slightly higher, these photons are not very efficient in heating up the gas and they mainly free stream. The mean free path is, much, is very large and so they diffuse basically imprinting this large but faint regions uh, in the temperature. But when the X-ray sources are more efficient, uh, more softer with uh, typical energies being lower of about 0.2 kV, they actually are very efficient in heating up the gas, input all their energy close to the sources, uh, creating the strong features in the gas temperature maps. And then when we cal yes, okay, thank you, thanks. When we calculate the corresponding 21 centimeter maps, uh, they also look very different depending on the 
temp on the characteristic of X-ray spectrum. So in the case of hard photons, uh, 21 centimeter maps look diffused uh, with large features. In the case of soft sources, they are more focused with small scale features. So we see how the details of the first X-ray binary population can actually be measured from this 21 centimeter background. And finally, I'm talking, uh, uh, finally, reionization happens at, uh, we know from observations, it is done by Rachel 5. So it was on the way in the redshift range about 5 to 10 or 5 to 15. And even though there are already many observations that uh, tell us, that inform us about reionization, uh, there is still a lot of scatter in it. Uh, there are properties of, um, again, first stars and galaxies that we don't know about or have not constrained yet with data that contribute to a large variety of possible signals. For example, one of the most interesting, I find, questions is uh, whether there is a, the scale of ionization extending to high redshifts contributed by small dark matter halos or whether it was all uh, focused at the last uh, five to ten uh, redshifts. Uh, and final ingredient is uh, the dark matter. So what I showed you is based on the cold dark matter assumption that uh, all dark matter is composed of uh, um, weakly interacting dark matter particles. But in other theories, dark matter can be very different. For example, axion dark matter is very popular now. Uh, and in that case, uh, structures form differently and stars can be distributed differently around the cosmic web. Uh, and uh, that would all affect how 21 centimeter maps look like. So there is a, a lot of observations going on, as I mentioned, and you'll hear today later about this rich experiment from Eloy. Uh, but there are also many other experiments that try to uh, test edges signal and also try to detect the signals on their se them by themselves. There are many power spectra experiments that already produced upper limits on the 21 centimeter fluctuations from uh, cosmic dawn and ionization. And uh, this field is really vibrant and many things are happening right now. <laughs>